Insulin resistance is when cells of the body don't respond properly to the hormone insulin. Basically, someone who is insulin resistant needs more insulin to have the same impact than someone who is insulin sensitive. And I've been a doctor since 2009 and a GP since 2015. And despite the fact that insulin resistance underlies many of our chronic health conditions, it's just not something that is talked about, recognized, or addressed until it's too late. By the end of this video, you're gonna know the key signs that you're becoming insulin resistant so you can take action to stop it. Hi Carb Dodgers, my name is Dr. Dan Mags. I'm so glad you've landed on my channel, which is all about achieving a lasting weight loss through low carb, real food nutrition. If that sounds good to you, then I'd love it if you'd subscribe to my channel so you can get notified whenever I release a new video. Insulin resistance is synonymous with poor metabolic health. Metabolic health relates to how the body processes and uses energy from the food we eat. Sadly, poor metabolic health often leads to type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, and other inflammatory conditions. It is a major problem throughout the world. For example, it's thought that only one in eight American adults have good metabolic health. Sadly, the signs of insulin resistance are there for months or even years before the diagnosis of one of these diseases, often going unrecognized by many health professionals. So, what if we could recognize some of the indicators of insulin resistance, identify what the problem is, and therefore resolve them before we develop these chronic states of really poor health? So let's get started. The signs of insulin resistance, they're not in any particular order. It's a little bit potluck as to which signs an individual will demonstrate. So make sure you watch all the way till the end. Number one is central obesity. Excess fat stores are never healthy in the long term, but fat stored around the middle, what we call central obesity, is specifically associated with insulin resistance. Your body will produce insulin in response to raised blood glucose levels. Any glucose that is not immediately needed for energy has to be stored somewhere. Most of that gets turned into fat. The ability to store excess food as fat is a survival process passed down from generations before who had to endure long periods without food. The ability to lay down fat stores in the good times, to call upon for energy during the harsh winter months, enabled humans to survive as a species. However, for most people living in the Western world, there's never a time of food scarcity. We're constantly laying down fat stores for a winter that just never comes. As we continually overload the body with excess foods, in particular sugar and carbohydrates, we exceed the capacity to store fat under our skin, which differs from one person to the next. We then start storing fat in and around our central organs in our abdomens, such as our liver and pancreas. It becomes a vicious cycle of high insulin causing fatty deposits in this area. The more fat we have here, the more it becomes resistant to the effects of insulin. This in turn leads to higher insulin levels and more fat storage. And it's well documented that fatty deposits in and around our organs, so-called visceral fat, causes damage over the long term. There are clear links with the development of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and high blood pressure. So, from a practical point of view, consider where do you store fat? Is your waist circumference more than half your height? If it is, this is a good indicator that you're building visceral fat. Unfortunately, many medical practitioners only consider the body mass index, which is not a good assessment of whether your fat stores are harmful or not. Number two is elevated blood glucose. Your blood glucose or blood sugar levels should be closely maintained within a narrow range. Uh, here in the UK, we use the range four to seven, but I'm gonna throw some other numbers up on the screen in case you are familiar with a different numbering system. When working well, your insulin production works to keep these levels stable regardless of what you've been eating by enabling glucose to be moved in and out of your blood coming out of storage when we haven't eaten and going into storage when we have. If you've had a check at your doctor's, like a routine blood test, it's likely that you will have had your HbA1c or hemoglobin A1c levels checked. This is a useful guide to your average blood glucose levels over approximately a three month period. It's really useful for diagnosing diabetes. However, long before you have a raised HbA1c, your fasting blood glucose levels can be raised, indicating insulin resistance in the liver. 
Fasting levels are usually taken first thing in the morning when you've had nothing to eat or drink except water for a 12 hour period before the test. And this is a really easy way to check yourself at home with a blood glucose monitor. And these are available from most large pharmacies, supermarkets, and of course, online. The other thing you can check with a blood glucose monitor is your blood glucose response to food. Check before you eat and two hours after. And irrespective of what you've eaten, your blood glucose should be back to a baseline of between four and seven within that two hour period. If it takes longer to come down, then this can also be an indicator of insulin resistance. Number three is cholesterol or lipids. When you get a lipid panel or your cholesterol checked at your doctor's, this measures more than simply your cholesterol. In fact, it doesn't actually measure your cholesterol levels at all. That's a different topic for a different video. Sadly, many doctors still just advise their patients on the basis of their total cholesterol or their LDL levels, often referred to as bad cholesterol. However, part of the diagnostic criteria for metabolic syndrome as set by various bodies, such as the World Health Organization, doesn't actually mention LDL. Instead, they talk about HDL levels and our triglyceride levels because it's the ratio between either the triglycerides and the HDL, or the ratio between HDL and your total cholesterol levels that indicates insulin resistance and your risk for cardiovascular disease. You wanna aim for a higher HDL level and a lower triglyceride level in order to have lower risk. So why do so many doctors focus on LDL and don't address low HDL or raised triglycerides? The answer, is statins, the drugs for lowering cholesterol. Statins only work to reduce LDL rather than actually the underlying cause of heart disease. Despite their best efforts, pharmaceutical companies have never been able to produce a drug that raises HDL. So the well-researched and well-documented criteria for cardiovascular disease risk that were developed off massive studies such as the Framingham Heart Study just pretty much get ignored. So next time you get your lipids checked, ask for your HDL and triglyceride levels so that you can get a true picture of your risk. Number four is fatty liver disease. Fatty liver can be caused by excessive alcohol consumption. However, there is a huge growing problem around the world of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It is thought that a staggering 25% of the adult population of the world has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It can be picked up by an ultrasound scan of the abdomen, but central obesity, like we talked about earlier, is a strong indicator, with 80 to 90% of obese adults having fatty liver disease. It can also be indicated by abnormal liver function tests. However, normal liver function tests don't mean that you haven't got fatty liver disease. This fatty infiltration of the tissues of the liver can often be ignored by medics as not being a serious issue because it's almost expected if a person is overweight. I have to hold my hands up and admit that back when I was in training, I can recall seeing a patient who'd been diagnosed with fatty liver disease on an ultrasound scan. Because at that time, I didn't really understand the link between nutrition and fatty liver disease, I simply assumed that the patient was drinking far more alcohol than he was admitted to. The problem is that a fatty liver is an unhappy liver. Fatty liver causes insulin resistance and therefore type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease. It is also a leading cause of liver cancer and cirrhosis of the liver. Like many signs of insulin resistance, the problems lie undetected for possibly years before a diagnosis. In the words of Professor Roy Taylor, before a diagnosis of type two diabetes, there is a long silent scream from the liver. Number five is blood pressure. Hypertension or high blood pressure is a huge issue, both as part of disease process such as cardiovascular disease and kidney problems, but also as a standalone disorder. It's usually labeled as essential hypertension, where the word essential basically means we don't really understand the cause or it's just put down to aging. Now, aging, of course, does have an effect on blood vessels and heart function, which can lead to raised blood pressure. However, I, like a growing number of doctors, really do believe that hypertension is a clear sign of insulin resistance for many. There are several reasons for this, but in a nutshell, 
The kidneys regulate the amount of fluid within our bodies. Too much fluid and the blood pressure will go up. Elevated insulin levels cause the kidneys to retain fluid within the body. When we address the elevated insulin levels by going on a low-carb diet or fasting, the kidneys stop retaining that fluid and blood pressure goes down, often within a matter of days. And I've seen many people reduce or completely get off the blood pressure medication they thought they would have to take for the rest of their lives. Now, the definition of hypertension varies from country to country, but generally anything higher than 140 over 90 is considered high. So if you haven't done so recently, perhaps get a check on your blood pressure, know your blood pressure level, and then you can take action. Now, these first five symptoms of insulin resistance are all markers of poor metabolic health. And if you have three or more of them, then you officially have metabolic syndrome. And unfortunately, your risk is much greater for the diseases associated with this, such as type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, etc. The next two are perhaps even well less known for their association with insulin resistance, but are nevertheless potential indicators. Number six is skin conditions. We've talked about the effects of insulin on blood glucose and on the kidneys, but insulin can also be considered a growth stimulating hormone. It's no wonder that its effects will be seen across our biggest organ, our skin. It can be easy for us doctors to see skin problems as an isolated issue. However, we need to see many skin conditions as ref a reflection of what's happening internally. I certainly wasn't aware until I started my weight loss journey that insulin resistance has links with so many skin conditions. And I've had loads of messages from clients whose skin conditions have just cleared up. And before I take you through the following skin conditions, I'm not saying that these are all caused by insulin resistance or that everybody who has these skin conditions has insulin resistance. What I'm saying is that we as doctors, when we encounter these conditions, should start to think about what is going on beneath the skin that may help us pick up insulin resistance earlier. Skin tags. These are often seen as small fleshy growths in the creases of the skin around the neck or the armpit, stimulated by an overgrowth of skin due to the effects of insulin. Acanthosis nigricans, seen as thickened, velvety patches of skin, again around the neck and armpits most commonly, another example of skin overgrowth stimulated by excessive insulin production. Hydradenitis suprativa, thankfully commonly shortened to HS. This is a painful long-term skin condition that causes abscesses and scarring on the skin. Usually occurs around hair follicles in areas of sweat glands, such as the groin, armpits, buttocks, and under the breasts. We have a protein in the body called mTOR, which is a regulator of cellular growth. This is stimulated by food intake. Overstimulation, typically by the Western diet and also puberty, is linked with excessive insulin release, which can lead to these painful cysts. The same is also true with acne vulgaris, which is typically seen in adolescents, but not always. A symptom of hormonal changes, possibly aggravated by a Western diet, causing overgrowth and inflammation in the skin. Psoriasis is an autoimmune condition and the reddened scaly patches of skin are driven by a systemic inflammatory response. The inflammation is also associated with the cytokine release as part of our immune system being triggered. It is known that we can have excessive cytokine release from fat cells. Cytokines are part of our immune response, which is vital at times of infection. However, like many things, too much can be a bad thing. Thrush. Thrush is a fungal skin infection that can occur in the mouth, warm skin crease areas such as the groin and breast, and also the genitals. Candida is the name of, or candida is the name of the fungus, and usually our immune system can deal with it. However, it will thrive when there is an ample supply of glucose, particularly if our immune system is compromised. We know that insulin resistance can lead to raised blood glucose levels, and this excess of glucose will be found in sweat, saliva, and our urine, so feed infection in these areas. Poor skin healing. If you've had a traumatic skin wound, and I don't necessarily mean a major one that has been slow to heal, this can be a sign of insulin resistance. If you remember that chronic inflammation occurs as a result of persistently raised insulin 
and also from the cytokines released from fat cells. But whilst inflammation is a necessary part of wound healing, if it doesn't settle down, then new skin cells are unable to form. And additionally, too much glucose can cause bacterial growth and feed infection and further delay healing or worse, lead to a more widespread infection. Number seven is poor reproductive health. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS, is the most common form of female infertility. And much like the kidneys are sensitive to insulin, so are the ovaries. Too much exposure to insulin prevents the conversion of testosterone to estrogen, which is a normal process. So there is not enough estrogen to signal the release of an egg on a monthly basis. So the partially matured eggs get retained in the ovaries, which appear as cysts. Without the release of an egg, there will be no chance of pregnancy. The higher levels of testosterone cause the male signs of PCOS, cause the facial hair and body hair, and male pattern baldness. And PCOS is now commonly treated with metformin, which is a diabetes drug. Because, yeah, you guessed it, it helps to improve insulin sensitivity. And yet most medics don't associate the symptoms and treatment with insulin resistance. I've yet to meet a woman with PCOS who has been advised about the link between her diet, insulin resistance, and her condition. Have you suffered from PCOS? Did you know it was related to insulin resistance? Gestational diabetes. Pregnancy is a state of natural insulin resistance. It allows the woman to lay down some fat stores to ensure she has adequate energy supplies to nurture the growing baby. This should then return to normal after pregnancy. Gestational diabetes happen when that natural insulin resistance becomes deranged and blood glucose levels become too high. This is usually associated with pre-pregnancy obesity or a family history of diabetes. Women are then at higher risk of diabetes later in life and should be screened annually to check for diabetes. And it's not just women that can be affected, men can be affected too. High body fat levels in men can cause low testosterone levels. And this is because fat tissue contains an enzyme called aromatase. This enzyme converts testosterone into estrogen. The more fat tissue, the more aromatase, and the more estrogen you have, which means less testosterone. Low testosterone can affect sperm production and is a cause of infertility in men. This can also affect a man's energy levels, sex drive, and muscle strength. And of course, erectile dysfunction, as well as low testosterone levels, which can affect erectile function, Insulin resistance can also affect the dilation of blood vessels. For the same reason as hypertension, the reduced dilation of blood vessels can cause erectile problems. So the possibility of insulin resistance should be explored in patients who present with this condition. So we've had a look at the many and varied signs of insulin resistance. What it really tells us is that too much insulin and insulin resistance causes widespread problems that present as different external signs. Individuals may exhibit one or many of these signs. If you recognize any of these in yourself, then now is the chance to take action and improve your health before you develop any of the more sinister consequences of poor metabolic health. And that is the focus of this entire channel. So if that is of interest to you and you're not subscribed already, then I'd love it if you would subscribe to this channel so that you get a notification whenever I release a new video. And that's it for today's video. Let me know what your key takeaway message is down in the comments and give it a thumbs up if you've enjoyed it. And hopefully I will see you in the next one.